Great. Thank you, Joseph. And I'll just start off by saying Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, wishing everyone a happy 2021. Um, so to start things off here, uh, just to say overall, we're in a good place. Uh, we've worked hard and I just want to um, give credit, of course, to Tricia and Alicia and others here at the Department of Health, Courtney Hawkins across the state, uh, who have really worked uh, nonstop to set up the systems for efficient distribution of vaccine uh, here in our state. And those systems are working and we're working to improve and set them up um, every day. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles we're facing right now is that we're just not getting a lot of vaccine. And I just want to emphasize that we're receiving roughly 14,000 doses a week of vaccine. Uh, in the state, uh, in Rhode Island. And to put that in context, uh, that's enough to vaccinate roughly 1.5% of the state uh, in a given week. So 1.5% of the population. Uh, so definitely it's going to take a while to reach the whole state. Uh, and we understand uh, that there's great demand for the vaccine now. I think it is frustrating for us on the public health side and certainly as a physician, you know, if we had a magic wand, we would of course vaccinate everyone at once. Um, and so it's frustrating as us for us as well to not be able to get out there and really vaccinate everyone, um, which is why uh, in, in with guidance from our vaccine subcommittee and and others at the state level is that we're really uh, making vaccine available to people at the highest risk settings, uh, such as healthcare. Uh, such as people in uh, nursing homes, assisted livings, et cetera. So the good news is we are uh, ahead uh, or at least on par with most other states when it comes to doses administered um, per 100,000 people. And, and Trisha and Alicia are going to provide some hard numbers for you there. Uh, and again, just thanking people and reminding people um, that there are a lot of complexities and logistics involved in getting people vaccinated. And we are working uh, diligently on this end to, to get the vaccine out to the community. Um, uh, the other thing uh, I just wanted to comment on briefly, there's been a lot in the news about um, dosing intervals and about changing dosing schedules, et cetera. Um, I'm sure that many of you have read about some of these ideas nationally and even across the world. The UK is, uh, is, is, is doing some different um, things for their dosing schedule. But I want to remind people too here in Rhode Island that the current recommendations by the CDC and FDA are based on the best available evidence. The studies that were done on both the Moderna and Pfizer and other vaccines um, uh, the current recommendations are based on those studies. And we're watching all the signs closely and really following the best evidence to date. Um, again, uh, guided by CDC and FDA recommendations. So um, with that in mind, at the moment, we are still here in Rhode Island uh, going to be using the vaccine as indicated uh, as uh, put forth in the EUA with the three and four dose uh, intervals between the, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna respectively. So I just wanted to to put that out there as well. And lastly, before I turn it over to Trish, um, I did want to bring up one other topic that's been in the news, and this is that variant strain. Uh, so I think, you know, this was something uh, that was first detected and brought to our detention um, uh, in the, over the last few weeks has gained a lot of uh, media attention. So first off, I just want to say that it's, it's normal for viruses, really any viruses, to constantly change through mutation. So it's not, it was not surprising to see new variants um, of COVID-19 um, occur. And so what's hit the, uh, a lot of the sci scientific community, the media, is in the United Kingdom, a new variant has emerged, um, which appears to be spread more easily and quickly than other variants. And of course, that's concerning. The good news is it does not appear to cause more disease or make people sicker, um, but it does potentially appear to spread more easily. And so we are watching that closely. Um, that variant specifically has been detected in numerous other countries around the world, including the United States. Uh, I will say that we here in Rhode Island do participate in a CDC initiative to sequence SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, from our state. And so we are randomly selecting uh, different specimens uh, here in our state, sending them out to the CDC for sequencing. And the good news is, 
is that we have not found that strain in Rhode Island uh, to date. So I just wanted to, to emphasize that. And also that, um, uh, that our state health lab uh, led by Dr. King um, is working with uh, some local Rhode Island experts and scientists uh, here at Brown on sequencing some additional specimens um, to see what strains we have in our state. So, um, so there's more to come on that. Again, we are actively uh, uh, conducting surveillance for this, looking for this. Um, but right now we have not seen the variant. And I think the other piece of good news and a couple other questions that we tend to get here at the Department of Health is that the testing, um, the testing that we use, both the PCR-based testing and the antigen-based point of care test will still uh, detect this new variant. So even if this variant is circulating, uh, the testing should pick it up. Uh, and the other, uh, uh, the other uh, point out there too is that the vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine um, today are expected to protect, protect against these strains. And that's something also that I want to emphasize is that when the vaccine companies uh, design and develop these vaccines, they're often done um, so with uh, the fact that other variants are expected to emerge over time. Uh, so this was, uh, again, to some degree expected, uh, and there's every indication at the moment that these vaccines will protect against this and other strains. Um, but again, it's going to be a little bit of a moving target, uh, something that we're watching closely uh, and certainly more to come. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Tricia. Great, thank you, Dr. Chan. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am happy to report that as of 9 a.m. this morning, um, the total number of reported doses of vaccine administered is 26,163. Um, so we are making steady progress with the vaccine that we have. Um, we have received around 46,000 doses um, of vaccine. This does not include the doses that were allocated to the long-term care um, CVS Walgreens partnership. That's around 18,525 doses, um, which they will be administering over the course of the next two weeks. These are first doses. Um, and this week we anticipate that we will receive, as Dr. Chan mentioned, um, we're only receiving around 14,000 doses a week, but we do anticipate to get around 6,600 doses of Moderna and we will get around 6,800 doses of Pfizer. But again, that Pfizer vaccine um, goes to um, the, the long-term care partnership um, as we continue to work um, through that, um, you know, um, that, that allocation. Um, so again, vaccines not, you know, the amount um, is, is not substantial, but when it comes in, it's immediately allocated um, and distributed out to the various locations to get people vaccinated. Not sure if there's anything else on that. I can pass it over to Alicia. Sure. Uh, Joseph and Marie provided me with some slides. Do you want me to show them? Um, yeah, if you have it there, or I can. It's a easier for you, Alicia. Yep, I have it right here. If that's. Make sure, I hit the right button here. Does that show? Okay. Great. Yep. Um, so this is um, the overarching broad strokes of who's been vaccinated and who we're vaccinating this week. Um, so as we've talked about before in terms of the prioritization schema, uh, there is very little in our world that is discrete and can be um, fully executed in just one week. So very early in the response, we started um, with our hospital employees and the patients at Eleanor Slater, as well as the mass vaccinators um, and, and their volunteers and staff. We need to make sure that those folks who are out on the front lines doing the vaccinating are protected. Um, we then moved on in week two um, to the medical staff, the high-risk correctional officers, and the high-risk um, incarcerated uh, persons who are at the ACI. Um, and that's an ongoing process. There are a number of people who live and work there. So that's going to take us several um, weeks, if not months to work through the entirety of the population there. Um, as everybody knows, Central Falls is piloting um, a number of innovative uh, vaccination strategies that really um, capitalize on their health ambassadors program and their community-based healthcare providers. And so um, we've been allocating doses to Central Falls starting at the end of, uh, or I'm sorry, right in the middle of week three. 
Um, and we also last week, as you know, uh, activated five regional points of dispensing or pods so that we could vaccinate EMS and home health and hospice workers. Because we had an initial um, slow uptake, we shifted and we ensured that um, school nurse teachers who are on the front line in the municipalities, as well as uh, their first responders were added. We then added our urgent care centers to that model, while also um, taking any of our respiratory care clinics who were not already health centers who are now vaccinating their own staff or urgent care centers who are going to regional pods um, to get those uh, respiratory care clinic staff who are not only doing specimen collection, but who are doing in-person um, assessments for other clinicians to ensure um, that their patients who are symptomatic are safely assessed and appropriately triaged and treated. Um, and then finally this week, we have added some frontline workers, including um, the state health laboratory staff, the office of the state medical examiner staff and nursing home surveyors. Um, their vaccination process will, will begin this week. It will take time again for all of these functions because all of these are um, employment based. As you know, we can't vaccinate everybody together at the same time uh, because of the immune response. We know that sometimes people don't feel well the next day or for a few days after they've been vaccinated. So we need to ensure that people are forward leaning in terms of their um, planning for uh, how to evenly distribute their staff so that we don't take out accidentally an essential function while people are being vaccinated. So all of these groups are still in process and, and will be for several weeks. We are also, um, we've also been talking a lot about what the timeline looks like when we are um, when we are allocated vaccine through actual vaccines in arms, as I'm sure many of you are covering and have seen in the mainstream media, there's a lot of lingering question about why, at the, you know, the moment vaccines are allocated, they are not immediately in someone's arm. I keep using this analogy that the public expectation is that we have a truck pull up into a parking lot. There's a line of people who are there waiting to get vaccinated and a happy pharmacist or, you know, a provider hops off the back of that truck and just starts vaccinating people in the parking lot. Um, there's a lot of accountability that goes along with vaccine handling and management, and there are a number of steps in the process. So just to walk you through the process, um, on Tuesdays, we receive our federal allocation. It's when the numbers are initially released to us. On Wednesday, they do the calculations about the pharmacy partnership, and those numbers get removed. And on Thursday, our final allocations are presented to us and ordering I'm from our federal... I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Um, our federal allocation is presented to us Thursday after uh, Thursday evenings, and that's the earliest we can order vaccine for the following week. So then shipping happens um, typically over the weekend and into early the following week. It's not until the vaccine actually ships that we receive notification of when it's going to arrive. So any of the vaccine that's coming will arrive on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and or Thursday of the following week, depending on how many sites and where we happen to be in line for shipping um, on the days that it is arriving. So it makes it very difficult to plan for the same week um, use of the vaccine. The earliest we could potentially use that vaccine is the weekend because we aren't sure early enough in advance when the vaccine will actually be arriving in the state. So we receive it at our um, at, a, at a state storage and redistribution site so that we can um, break it down and push it out to partners. So when you see um, the, the partners with whom we're working in Central Falls, for instance, or um, some of the um, smaller healthcare partners, because the allocation doses are very large, um, we may redistribute to them. Um, or, you know, larger sites like the hospitals may be receiving direct shipment. Um, we then, again, redistribute the vaccine as necessary, and then all partners are able to administer the vaccine. So it, the timeline itself is tricky because we, like everybody else, want to ensure that vaccine is turned around as quickly as possible and that we can get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, but there are these um, logistical processes that we have to get through in order to actually receive, redistribute, and then administer the vaccine. And as I mentioned, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have is that right now we are focused primarily on employer groups, which means that there needs to be some spacing of all of those employees. We can't have everybody get vaccinated at once. 
Um, we also, um, unlike other events like a typical seasonal flu clinic where um, you know, we may change this moving forward with all of the things that we've learned in this event about masking and social distancing, but we let people stand on top of each other oftentimes in line when they're getting vaccinated for flu. Um, and we can't do that in COVID. It just spreads too rapidly and it presents far too much danger. So we really need to have scheduled vaccination instead of, you know, open hours for people to come in and get vaccinated. We need people to remain um, six feet apart while they're getting vaccinated and going through that process. So um, we need need a day or two to be able to schedule um, the appointments when we're confident that we have the vaccine and the appropriate ancillary supplies, which are shipped separately. We need to make sure we have all of that in hand before we can actually schedule the clinics and get everybody up and running. Um, you know, somebody brought up the first week of the vaccine, we had winter storm gale. So we had, uh, we were biting our nails with concern about whether or not the vaccine would actually arrive at the end of the week, um, because we knew that um, even here in Rhode Island, we had shut um, tractor trailer traffic. So we, we weren't sure where the trucks were and, and again, what kind of impact that would have. And fortunately it was very little impact, but tis the season for us in New England um, to have some very bad weather. So we know that that could be um, a unique challenge for us when we are waiting for a vaccine or trying to redistribute vaccine or stand up clinics. You know, we, there are not everybody likes to go out in the bad weather and we understand and respect that. I'm sure our municipal and state police partners uh, would be in agreement with that where, you know, when the weather is bad, if we can keep folks off the road, um, it's, it, it's of benefit. So we'll always be weighing those risks and benefits and we're aware of the significant impacts that any, any and all of these things have on our ability to vaccinate. But we know that this is a very prominent story. We know that people are really interested in calculating the numbers of how um, how our allocations versus receipt versus um, versus uh, doses administered are playing into things. And so it, it's something that we are hyper aware of that we are working diligently with our partners to ensure that we are distributing vaccine in a way that ensures that it can be vaccinated as quickly as possible and is spending very little time uh, waiting until it gets into arms. Um, but you know what will happen over time is uh, the numbers will shift because we will always be in sort of this, uh, you know, seven days or fewer time frame between receipt of vaccine and administration of vaccine, um, and the more vaccines we have administered, the uh, we will begin to see a more significant difference between um, what's in process and what's actually been administered. So um, we know that that's very frustrating to hear, and that it's um, difficult to understand because of all of this processing. Um, but this is um, this is the reality of, of where we are. And um, as you saw from the first slide, we have a tremendous amount of activity that's ongoing in terms of um, the different venues and partners uh, we're so pleased to be working with in terms of administering vaccine. So I think I'll stop there, Joseph, unless there's anything else um, you'd specifically like me to cover. No, thank you, Alicia, that was perfect. Um, <clears throat> if folks have questions, they're free to come off of mute and um, put them to Dr. Chan and Trish and Alicia. This is Michelle Smith from AP. Are you seeing any hesitancy among the people in the first priority group to getting the vaccine? I can speak on the from the hospital based. I'm on staff at a couple of the major hospitals here in Rhode Island, uh, including uh, chatting with my colleagues here. There's been excellent uptake um, at the hospitals uh, and among the healthcare workers in general. Um, there's a lot of excitement. Uh, people are chomping at the bit, uh, which is which is great. Um, so in the in the healthcare workers, uh, especially at the hospital based systems, just really great uptake um, and not a lot of hesitancy in that group. Alicia or Tricia, did you want to comment on anything else you're seeing on the ground level? I would say in most venues, we are um, we are also seeing that. One of the difficulties is is that we um, it's sometimes difficult to assess what the denominator is when we are looking at the total number of uh, people who are getting vaccinated, and because um, we are asking people to 
pause so that they are not all getting vaccinated at the same time. In some employment situations, that can be a little bit tricky. So we are working with CVS and Walgreens, and there's new reporting um, that's coming online, both at the federal level um, and you know through our partnership with CVS and Walgreens so that we can better assess what hesitancy looks like at the nursing home um, level at this moment in time. We certainly um, have heard stories that there is some hesitancy, and then we have other nursing home administrators who are telling us that they have near 100% uh, of people who are standing in line to get vaccinated. So we've been working um, with a number of our partners. We've been trying to um, promote tools uh, about having conversations with staff about um, getting vaccinated, what their concerns are so that we can help address them. We've asked our partners to share those stories back with us so that if there are specific concerns that we're not addressing in our messaging or that there aren't um, packages that have already been developed that we could be utilizing to help support people in their decision making, we'd be happy uh, to continue to work with them. I've met with the unions uh, who work in the nursing homes and they've been incredibly supportive of, as well. So um, so again, I, I think unfortunately we don't have a great um, exact numerator and denominator to be able to say, you know, here's our exact data across every nursing home that's that's been approached so far for vaccination and because they're on a three clinic cycle. Um, so part of the CVS Walgreens partnership with the CDC is that each nursing home will be visited three times. So some people may choose to get their first dose at the second clinic. Um, and that's and that's something that we are very aware of um, and understand. We've also um, asked CVS and Walgreens and they've agreed to create retail store opportunities so that we can spread those um, nursing home staff over a greater period of time, giving them more opportunities to get vaccinated and not all at the same time. Um, and those processes are still coming online. Um, so there may also be staff who are just waiting for that opportunity so that they are able to get vaccinated, but not at the same exact time as their colleagues because of the critical functions they serve inside those nursing homes. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, all right, so are the, are you seeing any issues with demand or are the numbers that were the low numbers of vaccinations that we're seeing, is that mostly a supply issue or is there any combination going there? No, that, that's mostly a supply issue. And again, it's a, it's a brand new issue. So again, when vaccine is in pro the process that I described, um, it, it may just be that, you know, again, we've, we've shipped doses to specific partners. And again, they don't, they do not vaccinate everybody on the same day because of the types of populations we're currently vaccinating. So they may receive their allocation for, you know, how many folks they expect to um, administer vaccine to over the course of a week or two, but they can't deliver it. They cannot administer it all on day one because it would be harmful to the operation of the organization. So I think you will see those numbers change over time. And especially as we branch into other groups who are not all working together, um, you will see that shift um, happen, I think, very rapidly. I think the other th important thing just to mention to build off that is, um, as Tristan mentioned, we've given 26,000 doses in our state. Uh, we also haven't seen any unexpected reactions. So people in general are doing well. Uh, you know, people are experiencing, you know, expected reactions, sore arms, you know, some people are developing some more uh, systemic symptoms, fevers, chills, malaise, headache, etc. Uh, but 26,000 people have been vaccinated and in general, uh, people are doing well uh, throughout the state. So that's something else just to let your viewers and listeners know. Nothing unexpected. Dr. Chan, this is Lindsay Delucia with NBC10. Um, I'm just wondering, you had said that right now it's enough to vaccinate 1.5% of the state of, of the population each week. And correct me if that's wrong, if I heard that wrong. But um, with that, obviously, it will take a while to reach the whole state. What does this do to our timeline? What does this do to moving phase to phase and so on? Yeah, so great question. So again, uh, in sort of the theme today uh, is that supply is sort of the limiting factor, uh, but we're working as fast as we can. You know, I'm going to be optimistic uh, in thinking about, uh, you know, all of us want this to end and thinking about timetables to when we kind of get back to normal. 
Um, I'm going to be optimistic because remember, the vaccine is a piece of the puzzle, right? It's a it's a piece of our response, an important piece, a critical piece. Uh, but also we have natural immunity from the percent of the population that's been infected. We have masking and physical distancing. And I think with spring and summer, people will be outdoors again. Uh, so I'm going to be optimistic that all these things are hopefully going to come together uh, by early summer, you know, late spring, uh, and that we can have some degree of normalcy around that time. So um, I, I think that we're on, and I'll let uh, Alicia or Trisha comment on this. I mean, I think we're on a good timeline for the vaccines. Um, again, it's going to take a while, and I think we need to meet that, set that expectation, uh, and ask people to be patient for just a, a few months longer. But I think we're on good track with vaccine implementation, with everything else we do, uh, to really get a, a, a really firm handle on this pandemic, certainly uh, by summertime. Yeah, I will add to that. Thank you, Dr. Chan, that um, we are expecting that there will be um, additional vaccine, so increase in vaccine. We know that the federal government has purchased additional Pfizer um, and Moderna vaccine. And I, Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, because I might get them confused with the Moderna vaccine, 100 million additional doses in March. Is that correct? Um, sometime around there. Um, so we potentially, potentially could get more vaccine, but then there are also other vaccine candidates that are in line um, that we're anticipating could be made available um, sometime after March. So um, we're working towards, you know, um, this idea that the federal government will provide um, larger numbers of vaccine doses to us, but then also additional vaccine manufacturers coming on board. Thank you. And I just want to follow up um, quick as well. Will, will we be seeing, for example, this briefing become more regular or will we be seeing some of these vaccination numbers become more regular like we've seen in the past now COVID testing numbers and the COVID case numbers? We see those each week so we can keep track of them. Will the vaccination numbers and maybe information like this become more regular and more accessible? Yeah, Lindsay, we're putting up... Um a, a doses administered number each day, and we're building out our, our data systems around um, around uh, everything that we're doing with vaccines. So we are going to build that out and um, try to make more information uh, accessible publicly as we go. So that's um, that's definitely a yes. Okay, thank you so much. This is uh, Michael Billo from Motif Magazine. I uh, have a, really a couple of questions. One is from the pandemic relief bill. Um, there should be some money coming in. How much does Round expect to get? When does it expect to get it? And uh, to what purposes is that money going to be allocated? So, Mike, we might have to um, follow up with you on that. It seemed like Trish was going to add something. She might have some insight there, but I honestly might have to touch base with some other members of our team to give you a little bit more detail because these folks are, are focused a bit more on the vaccine operations. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that that would be right. Um, we we don't we haven't been notified as to exactly how much that means um, for us or for for other states yet. All right, on a, on a completely separate issue than directly to vaccine operations, the uh, WHO briefing this morning, uh, which included uh, the the new. Um, standards from SAGE talked about uh, some some areas because of limitations of supply going to extending the time between first and second dose. SAGE felt that there was clinical uh, evidence or information justifying up to six weeks and the UK is apparently going up to 12 weeks. Um, they didn't seem too enthusiastic about this because they didn't want to get beyond clinical data. Um, but one possibility, of course, is also giving out as many first doses as possible and then figuring out when the second doses will arrive, where the supply will arrive for second doses. Where does Rhode Island stand on that? Are, are, is Rhode Island going to try as hard as possible to adhere to the um, recommended protocol, uh, you know, 21 days or 28 days, depending on the particular vaccine? Or are you contemplating uh, trying to extend supply uh, using such means? Yeah, so that's a great question. I can take first crack and others should feel free to chime in. I mean, I think at the end of the day, 
Uh, we want to be very careful about operating outside of best practices, which are set forth by the CDC and FDA. Also keeping in mind that the people that set the best practices um, as part of the CDC and FDA are really national and world-renowned vaccine experts. Um, so the, you know, the best of the best are really the people in the U.S. Uh, that are coming forth with these guidance. And they tend to be based on uh, the best available data and science. And so I think that we always reserve the right here in Rhode Island to uh, be a little bit nimble and flexible and adapt, uh, you know, some of these things for, you know, what makes sense for Rhode Island specifically. Uh, but I think that we want to be very careful in doing that. And at this time, we are following the best guidelines and recommendations and science and evidence. So we don't have plans at this time to alter the path, the course uh, from what's formally recommended. But it is something we're looking at closely. We're receiving uh, guidance, uh, again, recommendations, uh, you know, local expertise from our vaccine subcommittee, from other experts uh, as part of our infectious diseases community, epi community here at Brown University, uh, other universities, et cetera. So something we're watching closely, but no plans to alter the current dosing schedule or dosing amounts. Can I ask a quick, uh, this is Michelle from AP again, a uh, question sort of related to that. Federal officials are holding doses in reserve and not releasing them to the states to make sure everyone who gets a first dose has a second dose. And with the limited supply that you're talking about, I'm wondering, um, do you support keeping doses in reserve for a second dose? Or should the federal government be releasing those second doses immediately with the assumption that they will be produced, the second dose will be produced by the time that person is due for a second dose? So again, I can take first uh, crack at this. I'll say that uh, we, of course, have very limited to no control over what the federal government decides to do. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, if you take the Pfizer vaccine, for example, we know that one dose has really limited efficacy in protecting people. Um, I've heard the number, uh, you know, 50%-ish. Um, and so I, I think it is within reason uh, for uh, the federal government to hold back some doses to ensure that people do get that second doses. I mean, one of the concerns that's been raised by the scientific community in general is we don't quite understand the downstream ramifications for if we only vaccinate people with a vaccine that's 50% effective, right? So everyone's been very focused on, you know, potentially foregoing that second dose and vaccinating as many people uh, with just one dose. But if that one dose is only 50% effective, what's that going to actually do to control the pandemic? And the answer is we don't know for sure. And it may have, you know, it may not be more effective, right, than uh, making sure some people are fully vaccinated. So these are the tough decisions that people are grappling with. Um, and again, you know, we're trying to follow the best science and data that's out there. And at this time, it seems to be that the best science and data is telling us uh, to give two doses at the recommended intervals. But I, I guess what I'm saying is not that you wouldn't get the second dose. It was that by not putting so many in reserve. There have been several people like Scott Gottlieb has suggested this and Tom Frieden have suggested it's not a good idea to hold sec so many second doses in reserve because so many people need a first dose. Do you, uh, I just wanna make sure you, I'm clear in my question that I'm talking about sticking to the same schedule, but but not holding so many doses in reserve, just to be clear. I, I think the challenge, Michelle, is that um, this is these are new vaccines, and we have learned, we certainly learned it during H1N1, that anything can possibly, anything that can go wrong in the vaccine production process will go wrong in the vaccine production process. So the Operation Warp Speed stance is that if we're going to initiate the the course, we need to be able to finish the course, and that's why they're holding the second doses, right or wrong, that's the that's the idea. So there would be some point in time, let's say they released 50% of those second doses just you know to begin the process of vaccinating again, we would wind up in a position of uh, potentially having 
a large group of people who are unable to get second doses if something else happens in the production process. So um, it's, it, is, it is an extremely safe um, mechanism that they're trying to utilize. Um, and again, I, I think that there are arguments to Dr. Chan's point, there are arguments on both sides for what, what could or should be better. But you know, this is up to the federal government at this point in time uh, to decide and, and we need to play by their rules or they may withhold the vaccine from us. That's you know, our other significant concern. Hi, this is Deja Moore from the Boston Globe. Um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Rhode Island is doing pretty well in terms of uh, doses administered by population uh, with pretty wide variation across the country. Are there any kind of natural advantages or specific steps that you've taken that you believe have um, helped you distribute the vaccine more quickly than many other states, including in New York? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, one of the other themes of this pandemic is that the states have been left um, given a lot of flexibility and a lot of these decisions, especially with related to vaccines, have been left to the state level. And I think, if you, as you've alluded to, a lot of states are doing uh, their own thing. Um, here in Rhode Island, you know, we've tried to have, you know, we've tried to engage different groups, stakeholders, communities to make these decisions. Again, we have a vaccine um, subcommittee, which includes a lot of people from the community. Uh, we are working across state government uh, in concert with the clinical sectors, you know, the, the different community-based organizations, trying to do our best to make sure that all voices are heard. Um, and again, there's no right or wrong answer uh, to this, which I think is what makes it so challenging. And again, my, you know, as a physician, someone that's used to taking care of a lot of different people, you know, my gut instinct is always to vaccinate everyone. Like that's that's what my my heart is telling me to do. And it's again, it makes me uh, frustrated that we can't just do that. But um, going back to the point that again, there's no right or wrong answer. We've tried to do our best, uh, also with guidance from the CDC and what they're recommending to. Again, guided by these principles of minimizing right death, uh, morbidity, disease from COVID-19 pandemic, while also maintaining equity, um, is to reach the populations that are affected and uh, at risk of being infected the most by the by COVID-19. And so, this includes obviously the healthcare um, sectors, nursing homes, uh, first responders, people that put their their lives at risk. And the other point too is we hope by vaccinating these significant uh, sectors is that it will limit transmission across the community in general. And that's one of the reasons too why we've looked at uh, Central Falls, for example. Uh, Central Falls has really, uh, in a lot of respects, uh, borne the brunt of the pandemic, always with a very high positivity rate. Um, the, the, the residents, the people that live there um, are really at high risk. And so to get partially the vaccine to people that need it most, communities that need it most, um, is one of the reasons why we prioritize, especially Central Falls. Anything to add to that, Alicia or, or Joseph? No, I think we've had a tremendous amount of success during H1N1, and that has been um, some of the bedrock that we've laid our plans upon. We are one of the states that has the highest vaccination rates in the country. And so we have phenomenal partners. We have great electronic systems that have been built. Um, and so we are just really trying to pile on uh, to those things that are that we've been able to utilize successfully during other vaccination campaigns and other emergencies so that we are poised and ready as this escalates. Um, I anticipate that at some point in time, the you know our uh, vaccine allocation will shift, and we'll have this happens in H1N1, and we'll have a deluge of vaccine. Um, and so we need to ensure that we're operationally ready for a shift where you know when the question came up earlier about what if you know they, uh, the FDA changes its stance on Moderna, and all of a sudden we have an extra you know, 6,600 doses per week. Are we are we prepared and ready uh, to ensure that we can distribute that to the, to the appropriate partners for rapid vaccination? Or because it would be just our luck, you know, the other vaccines, the next two in the pipeline may become available at the same time, um, which means we'll have to pivot incredibly quickly and, and change our, um, our mechanisms very quickly. 
we know that we understand that we are trying to plan for that so that we can be as effective as possible as quickly as possible because more than anybody else i think those of us who have been working in public health and healthcare want everybody who can be vaccinated to be vaccinated as quickly as possible this is sophia rudin from the public's radio i just wanted to ask you quickly about sort of last mile um hiccups and how you're dealing with them we've gotten a couple um reports of uh, sign-up links being shared with people who aren't eligible or scheduled vaccination shot, um, sorry, vaccination slots that were unfilled. How widespread are those challenges and, and how are you dealing with them so far? Uh, so this is the first time, obviously, that we've had events where we've required sign up to this degree. Obviously, during typical flu season, people sign up to get flu shots so that they have an appointment. Um, but on such a broad scale, it's particularly um, daunting. And so the systems that we are using are new. We were very disappointed to learn that people were um, sharing the links with people who are not in any of the priority groups. Um, so they were um, trying to cut ahead of the line for uh, individuals who are at higher risk um, and who have been determined should be vaccinated first. Um, so we did have to take down registration links yesterday so that we could um, so that we could assess who had been vaccinated. We had to cancel a number of appointments um, for people who were not eligible to be vaccinated, make appropriate notifications and follow up with our healthcare partners to say, we're sorry that um, you, you, know, you were unable to register for your event because all of the slots were filled uh, because we had this huge group of people who were not eligible who filled those slots. Um, so we are still cleaning that up and um, are trying to get our healthcare partners back on track uh, for their vaccination. It had no impact on today's operations um, for the pods that are operating today, nor do we expect it will have any impact on those that are operating tomorrow. Um, so we hope, you know, because everything will be back on track that registration can happen quickly and efficiently with the appropriate groups um, and can, um, we can get those folks vaccinated through next week. We have been working with our vendor. They have been responsive. Uh, we are not the only state in the country, nor is this the only vendor in the country that is experiencing this. Um, the demand for vaccine is clearly very high and people are willing to push others aside in order to get themselves or their loved ones vaccinated. Um, we understand everybody's concern and we understand that there are a lot of people who are at who are at the front of the line, who have been prioritized, and we have limited amounts of vaccines. So um, we're doing everything that we can to be vigilant about what um, the, our processes look like and to create any uh, protections around those that we possibly can. You know, those links were offered only to the eligible employers um, with language that said, please do not share these links beyond your employees. So some employees, you know, took that upon themselves. Um, we added extra slots because we've created more efficiencies already in our process and we wanted to um, build more healthcare workers into that vaccine process. So somebody went in and saw, hey, there are um, extra slots that are not filled. Healthcare workers must not want it and therefore invited all their friends and family. So um, it's laborious. It is heartbreaking um, and it is taking time and attention away from our primary mission, which is to get our prioritized groups vaccinated. Um, but it is unfortunately not surprising. We just hope that uh, people will be respectful of the process and know that we are fighting as hard as we possibly can to get as many vaccines in arms as we can and as many different opportunities as we can um, so that we can ultimately achieve the best vaccination rate um, we possibly can for everyone. And I just ask, um, thank you for that. I, you said huge. Can you just say what, what does huge mean? Um, we did not, I will tell you, Sophia, we did not count the official number. There were over 1,000 people who registered yesterday, um, which is not atypical. We're, we're trying to get uh, over 5,000 people vaccinated per week at the pods, um, but we were uh, very dismayed at the several hundred we had to delete from, from the system and, again, do those, those notifications to. Um, it creates an extra burden for our municipal partners who are running those pods who now have to run more interference at the front door um, for people who are not eligible to be vaccinated and likely will be heartbreaking to some people who didn't receive an email or cell phone if there was a typo um, in, their, in their phone number or um, email address 
so that they do think that they have an appointment and they somehow cheated the system and we're going to get vaccinated when they show up at any of the clinics um, in the upcoming week. Um, but I, I don't have an official number for you. It was it was several hundred. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, this is Brittany from Channel 12. A uh, quick question about the slide that you had on who is getting vaccinated this week. About how long do you think it'll take for those groups to be vaccinated? And can you give any insight on who might be next? Um, so if the regional pods are uh, closed opportunities. So we are hoping that all of the people who were eligible to be vaccinated at regional pods who are interested in getting vaccinated will be vaccinated over the course of this three week period of time. Um, if there are, um, I think, you know, from a hospital perspective, we um, anticipated an uptake rate of approximately 80% when we factored what our um, allocations would look like for hospitals. As Dr. Chan mentioned, there has been tremendous success um, at the hospital front in terms of the numbers of people who are getting vaccinated. So those numbers are actually higher. So we've been assessing with the hospitals how much more vaccine they need to get them over the finish line and assessing from a risk perspective because they too used a tiered system um, for prioritization um, where we can allocate that vaccine. Um, the nursing homes and nursing home staff are on a very set schedule with CDS and Walgreens. So their vaccination clinics for, uh, for first doses for most people um, will, be, um, will be over by um, January 16th. There are some people who, as I mentioned, will get uh, first doses at second clinics, will, which will begin immediately the week after. So everybody is on a three week cadence. So the full nursing home cycle because of those three visits is nine weeks. Um, we are, um, we did submit our paperwork to activate part B of the partnership, which will allow us to vaccinate um, um, residents and staff at assisted living communities, at uh, behavioral health and developmental disability group homes that are, um, that have individuals who live in them who are 65 and older, as well as um, some elderly housing complexes that provide additional care um, who were able to sign up for the partnership. Um, we don't have an exact start date for that, but we did uh, hit the go button on that with the CDC. So we are hoping that it will be um, sometime um, around January 18th. But again, we have not um, gotten final verification on that just yet. Um, the other groups um, may take a little while longer, um, the other healthcare workers, um, just because again, we just began some of them and they need some time and space to get their staff vaccinated. Um, the next groups that we really, the next big group that we see is really outpatient providers. We're working on a sort of a sub prioritization schema right now for how we will roll that out because we have um, limited vaccine and we have only um, we have a lot of outpatient providers, sorry. Um, so we expect, you know, based on the emails that we all receive very frequently, um, that demand will be high for providers and their staff. So we want to ensure um, that we have the best possible options available for them to ensure that they can get vaccinated um, safely and comfortably and as quickly as possible. If you look at our the prioritization schema we presented last week, um, there's, there are still some groups um, in um, in phases 1.1 through 1.3 that, um, again, will require some ongoing vaccination and who have not begun yet. So um, we are working, we're working on those and some who are partially done because um, they double dip in multiple environments. We have healthcare workers who work in multiple environments. So we're just trying to reassess and make sure that we can get everybody covered. Um, but our partners um, who are dentists, who are, um, who work at the blood center and, um, and in other, you know, again, outpatient environments are really high priority for us because of the risks that they're facing in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and, and the end of our phase one will be individuals who are 75 and older. So we're working with the Office of Healthy Aging, um, exploring the different environments where we can really begin to um, vaccinate both staff and um, the folks who are engaged in programs for individuals who are over 75 and those who are living independently. Um, so we have we have our work cut out for us. We do anticipate that at the rate that we're receiving vaccine, vaccine that um, unless any of those additional triggers that Trish mentioned with with either um, 
faster rates of production by the two vaccine manufacturers that are currently providing vaccine or any of the other vaccines coming online or something changing in terms of the guidance in terms of first doses or single doses for um, the, the two present vaccines, um, that, that phase one will really take us um, probably at least until March. So we are working really hard to, um, again, move as many parts as quickly as possible, um, but those are our priority groups in phase one. This is Brittany with ABC6. Um, is it safe to say, I know I feel like when we spoke with you guys maybe three weeks ago, we were talking about expectations for distribution um, and how much vaccine would be coming into the state. You had said, you know, these are estimations. We don't know if these numbers will be exact. Is it safe to say that the numbers that we're getting each week are way below what the expectation was? I feel like you had said like it was... A, 18,000 maybe a week? Sure, it, it, it changes so frequently that it's hard to keep track. So the math that we did initially based on what the anticipated national allocations were going to be would have put us at approximately um, 17,000, yes, just over 17,000 doses per week. That was our expectation um, about a month ago. We are currently getting about 13,500 doses per week. So it is less uh, than what we anticipated. Um, but we are, you know, waiting very patiently and listening as carefully as possible for any hints that that might change uh, in our favor. And also, did you say that there had been, when you were going through who had been vaccinated, who were vaccinated, did you say that there had been slow uptake among EMS? No, um, we have had, I think, a great response among all of the folks who are um, who are getting vaccinated at the regional pods. We have certainly heard anecdotally um, that there are people who are not interested in getting vaccinated at this time um, because they're evaluating what's happening and you know may choose to get vaccinated later. Um, which again, their their time clock is ticking because this is this is the opportunity presently to get vaccinated, and they may not have other opportunities to get vaccinated until um, you know more vaccine becomes available and is more widely open to the general public. Um, but overall, we have seen on all fronts uh, for the individuals who are eligible to be vaccinated a, a very healthy mix of all of the um, of all of the provider types. Let's say Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal, wondering what you are doing or can do to make sure that more people don't jump the line going forward. That was sort of a, a surprising number to hear, and I can't imagine that it's going to stop. What do you? What can you do? What are you doing? Sure. So we locked out the links, Wayne, so that um, so that folks could no longer register, and then work to change them. Our vendor is also um, creating some additional um, stop points in the registration process, which we hope will um, help deter folks from, um, from getting vaccinated. Again, people wrote some very compelling emails about how to game the system, um, and we um, didn't have an opportunity just in the way the system is built to, um, to put some stop gaps in there that say, that say um, you know, here's what's going to happen if you show up at a pod and you don't have the appropriate, you know, work identification. That was all part of the original email. But some of what we saw was that people stripped out what we had written and provided as guidance to our healthcare partners and had just essentially copied and pasted the links. So um, all of that will become part of sort of the frontline protective mechanism um, on, uh, on the electronic system for registration. Um, we, again, had to have that conversation with our municipal partners to ensure that they knew and understood what happened and that they could put um, additional screening if necessary in place. They've done, I think, an outstanding job at, at screening the partners. We have provided lists of who is eligible by agency type, not by individual name, but certainly by agency type. And because the people who, uh, who we are vaccinating by regulation have work ID requirements, um, it's, that has been uh, fairly straightforward for us because people are required to present a work ID that has an agency name on it that matches the list that each of the municipalities has and needs to have a photo ID and a name on it um, of the individual. So are there still people who could escape the process? Of course there are. Um, we're trying to, we're, we're talking to um, other partners across the country about what they're experiencing and searching for best practices so that we can um, try to ensure that people are um, 
that we have protections in place wherever we can to prevent it from happening? Do I think that we are going to 100% be able to prevent it from happening? Of course, I'm not naive enough to think that. Um, but I, you know, we really call upon the goodwill of Rhode Islanders uh, to ensure that they're following the rules. You know, we put these recommendations in process after dozens of hours of deliberation and conversation, as Dr. Chan mentioned, you know, with other um, experts and ethicists and, and others about really assessing risk and um, operational efficiencies. And uh, again, just trying to protect the right people, knowing that there are so many right people who, who should be protected. Um, so, you know, I, th I think it's, it's very unfortunate that, um, that folks are unwilling to follow um, the guidance that's been produced, but we're just going to have to continue to put protections in place uh, wherever we can. Thank you. This is uh, Michael Billow again. Do you have any insight, and I don't want to pin you down on something for which I know there's lousy data, but do you have any insight on a concern I've been seeing a lot on social media about the potential effectiveness or ineffectiveness of any vaccine uh, currently in use against the variants um, that have been detected throughout the world in the UK and South Africa uh, with the N501Y uh, mutation and so on? Yeah, again, that's a great question, something that is a concern. Um, but, uh, you know, there's been statements released by the manufacturers that, uh, and by other scientific experts and organizations that we do expect the vaccine to work against these new variants. Um, again, something that's not unexpected, again, something in development of these vaccines is that they develop uh, vaccines, you know, these, you know, this, this generation of the immune response uh, to, to do so against multiple potential variants uh, that potentially exist. So I'm going to be optimistic, um, but also, you know, even worst case, if a variant does uh, happen, uh, that the vaccine may be less effective against. Again, there's a whole spectrum here, right? It's not a yes or no, is the vaccine going to fail? Um, it's, you know, the vaccine may have slightly reduced efficacy, effectiveness against different variants. Again, I remained uh, optimistic that even if we do see that, and we may eventually, uh, the vaccines can be uh, tweaked, uh, you know, adapted to these new variants, which I'm also told, and from my research, um, it can be done in a relatively timely fashion. So I'm going to be optimistic. I think it's, you know, people are actively looking at this as we speak, and we should know more over the next few weeks. Great. Is Thanks, Dr. Any? Chan. I think we have one, time for one more question. Michael, did you have something you wanted to? Well, I, I was going to ask uh, whether there's any uh, concern either over the short or the long term about the uh, uptake of vaccines or success with vaccines leading to the development of a resistant strain of the virus? And if so, what the time frame for that might be? Would that be three months, six months, a year, two years, five years? Or does anyone have any idea? Yeah, so I think everything is so new in this pandemic. I'm reminded that it hasn't even been a year yet uh, here in Rhode Island uh, in terms of our first case that was diagnosed. So uh, it seems like a decade, uh, but it's been less than a year. So um, I think that's one of those huge outstanding questions that no one knows uh, that we will know more in the near future, certainly as time evolves here. Uh, I'm going to be optimistic again that the coronavirus uh, is different than other viruses like influenza. Um, it tends to be more stable, not mutate quite as rapidly. Uh, so I'm going to be optimistic that the vaccines that we have are hopefully a one-time thing. And uh, again, you know, you may we may need a booster shot. Uh, we may need, you know, we may need at some point to develop a secondary vaccine. This is all can be done. Um, uh, for sure, but I think that time will tell. I'm going to be optimistic, though, and hope that this is a, a one-time vaccine thing. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Chan, and thank you, everyone, for being with us today, um, and we'll be uh, back with you next week.